3 aw Well, in Australia and uh, Melbourne, we have a, a plethora of teenage rock and roll stations. What have you got? Fox FM, Double T, uh, Triple M, Triple M, Triple J. But in the old days, I'm going back to uh, the late 50s, early 60s, when I joined 3KZ, there was virtually only one program where teenagers uh, could listen to their favourite stars from overseas on record. And that was Platter Parade and the man who who brought us that every night and, uh, and all day Sundays, I remember. Stan the man, Stan Roth. Hello, Stan. Hello, how are you? What about a, a hello as we used to hear it? Well, I'll try. I've just worked three very late nights and I'm relaxing on a Sunday with a tinny. <laughs> right. But I'll try. Hello. Howdy, hi, Victoria. It's Stan the man, your old rocky jockey. Oh, that yeah. is wonderful. And of course, people who have access to your, your private phone number also get greeted the same way, I note, Stan. I have an energy service which uh, that goes just that way, but, um, well, you know, I'm one of these people that like to, like to let everyone know uh, my, my telephone number so that everyone can hear Stan the man as he used to be. It might get me a job again, who knows? Yes, it could. Where did it all start for you, Stan? Now, well, it started back really when I was uh, quite a baby. Uh, going to school in my very early days, I used to practice radio. I used to love KZ. Norman Banks was always my favourite uh, announcer. And uh, I used to take uh, Mum's uh, pots to bed with me and throw a blanket over the head. And because pots reverberate the echo of one's voice, uh, I play radio announcers. Well, believe it or not, I did the same thing, Stan. Not uh, with your mother's pots, but my mother's. Yeah, you're talking about pots you're cooking, aren't you? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> So, from there, you, uh, your love of radio uh, continued? Well, it did, yes, and uh, I was lucky enough to, uh, to meet a man called Bill Roberts, who ran the Bill Roberts uh, Radio School. Yes. I lasted there two weeks, and I finally was sent to 7AD in Devonport, Tasmania, where I lasted all of three months, and came back to 3AK. Then I spent uh, two, two and a half months at 3AK doing Midnight to Dawn programs only, because in those days, uh, there was only one Midnight to Dawn radio station, that was 3AK. Right. Uh, as you may remember, all the other radio stations had the good sense to open at six in the morning and close at midnight. Yes. <laughs> but uh, oh, 3AK was, was, a, there was a, a technician at 3AK. Um, his name was Arthur. He's passed on now. Arthur, and uh, it was a funny old studio at 3AK, uh, the old Mac Furnishing Company. But if you wanted an increase in money, uh, the man that ran the Mac Furnishing Company, he was, uh, he was uh, very, very religious. And uh, if you wanted an increase, you'd go to him and say, please, sir, may I have another one pound a week? And he'd tell you he'd pray for you overnight and ask God if you were worth it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Stan, are we talking about the old studios in Grey Street, St Kilda, where, where Lou Carr used to do breakfast? That's right, yes, 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 you are. On top of a bank building, I recall. That's right, mate, yes, yes. And, of course, the 3AK studio, uh, well, you could open a window at least, you know, it had curtains around it. That was the only soundproofing material we had in those days. And, I mean, if you barked, <laughs> barked outside the window, you'd have every dog in the shop in Ackland Street St Kilda bark back. <laughs> and Arthur used to yap at them while you were on the air. And every bloody dog in the neighbourhood would yap back. You couldn't hear yourself on the air. Ah, uh, lovely. And where from after 3AK, Stan? Well, I, I, I didn't stay there long enough, you know. Uh, I didn't... I wasn't granted the one pound extra. So, uh, according to uh, the man that ran the make furnishing company, uh, God really wasn't on my side. So I moved on then very quickly to, uh, to 3XY. Same year, by the way, 53. So I went to three radio stations in one year. And uh, I got to uh, 3XY and I found a, a little brat called Bert Newton. And I was doing the afternoon program there at 3X5 when I first went there. And uh, I used to do the Peter's Pals uh, afternoon program as well. Then I'd finish at, uh, at 6 o'clock and we'd go to the night program uh, with Hell Todd, I think, uh, Rolly Barley and, uh, and Clive Waters in those days. And uh, Bird used to do his uh, little bit there too. He was, uh, he was running around the place. I don't, think, I don't know what Bird ever did in the place. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very hard to remember. Uh, but I do know doing Peter's Pals in the afternoon, it was only a half hour program. And uh, Bert did uh, come into me one day and he said, would you mind if I read the commercials, uh, Peter's uh, ice cream commercials? And I said, well, go ahead and do it, you know, and he did. And eventually uh, I thought he's doing so well, I'll leave it to Bert and I'll go down to the Imperial pub and join the boys and have a beer. So that's the way Bert got started there with a full-time radio program at, uh, at 3XY. 
And uh, I was so good, of course, they promoted me uh, by 1954 to nighttime radio. <laughs> I don't know whether I was good or bad. But I got there with Hal Todd, he was my co-night announcer, and uh, Clive Waters, the late Clive Waters, who went for three years there as news director, and uh, Roddy Marley, who, who came from three years there to join 3XY. About that time, and you were on top of the Princess Theatre at the Quality Station stand, I think Tom Jones would have been scouting around. Yeah, well, he was scouting around. I, I recall 3XY as being more like a butcher shop than a radio station. <laughs> the quality radio, I always thought of quality meats. Uh, <laughs> Were you Stan the Man by this time? No, no, I, I hadn't progressed that far, at, you know, by 1954. Uh, Bert became our nighttime panel op, by the way, and he used to uh, play all the serials and also spin all the records for us. And, uh, but we could never find Bert because we were in the Princess Theatre and at that time Kismet was playing with uh, Hayes Gordon. And um, we used to find that the part of XY that led to the Princess Theatre upstairs overlooked the, the women's dressing rooms or the dressing rooms for the whole cast. And uh, we would find that in between the serials I'd say, Hal, we've got a commercial coming up, where's Bert? And he'd say, I don't know, he's, he's probably perving on the girls. And so we'd go and have a look, and sure enough, there was Bert leaning over the balcony looking at all the girls getting undressed in, in costume. Oh, we always loved show business. Oh, Bert loved show business, did he ever? By the way, he was quite a, uh, hilarious uh, on the program, you two boys run. I listened to Bert that night, and uh, there was just so much truth in what he said <laughs> about the old days. I got quite embarrassed about it all. <laughs> Stan, your golden days really began at 3KZ, and uh, that was my first full-time job as a panel operator with uh, Platter Parade on Platter Parade. I did the night shift, started at 5 when you started, and continued till close of transmission at 11.30. But in that time, you were as big as any local or international pop star, because your, yours was the link that teenagers of that time had with the big stars from overseas. Well, that's true, Bruce. True, Bruce. Uh, I joined KZ in 1955, and um, I left them in 1965, so I had 10 years there. So there were 10 great years and 10 very funny years, too. Very funny years. But, yeah, it's true that um, uh, teenagers uh, could relate to uh, one person because rock and roll was so new. And uh, no one really knew who Roy Orbison was, and no one really knew who uh, Elvis Presley really was. And all these stars and all these acts were quite new to teenagers. And uh, their link with the record artist you were playing on record and uh, the man that played the records, um, well, fell strongly in your court because you were the man that sold rock and roll. So therefore, you became bigger, really, than the stars on the records you played. And consequently, you became, uh, you became, you, you became the hero of all these teenagers. And, uh, and I found myself uh, time and time again uh, uh, almost locked out of 3K because there were so many kids uh, fighting to get in the studio doors that you'd have to fight your way through the kids with the aid of the policewomen to get to work. You know, they had policewomen on the stairs at KZ to keep them away from Stan the Man. But you know, Stan, you not only in those days, uh, w when I saw you at work, you not only played the records, but you, you launched a lot of careers in this city that uh, uh, I, should, I should think right now should be spoken of. People like Normie Rowe, Johnny Chester, just to name a couple, probably wouldn't be where they are today without the influence and the start that you gave them. Well, I feel that's very nice of you to say so, mate, but... Um I just, uh, I just realised that uh, Sydney was well ahead of us. So they had the Johnny O'Keefe's, they had the Cold Joys, they had the Lonnie Lees, and the D.B. Richards, and people like that. And uh, here in Melbourne, we virtually had nobody. So it was up to someone to do something about it. And being the only DJ in the town, really, it was up to, uh, left to stand the man. And um, so I went out and uh, I started comparing dancers right throughout Melbourne. I had a Volkswagen 1200, HPY237, because you used to call it Herbie. <laughs> so we had Herbie, and Herbie used to carry me for one dance all to another one. So eventually I, I, I did uncover the Johnny Chesters and also the Thunderbirds and the Benny McQuaid's and the Bobby Cookson's and the Colin Cooks and uh, so I went on and on and on and uh, I was able to work out record contracts uh, with record companies for all these people. I used to select the material that uh, they recorded and I used to play the records till uh, those records became hit records on the charts. Stan, you're talking about 1955. Uh, the, uh, the quality of Australian recordings left a lot to be desired in those days, didn't it, production-wise? Well, even in those days, we only had one-track machines, you know. It was all done in one take, and if you couldn't do it in one take, you had to do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. 
And uh, so, you know, we only had the one track to play around with. Uh, Sydney was no better. I mean, the early Johnny O'Keefe and Cold Joy and Lonnie Lee records weren't any better than uh, the early W and G and Astral records. Um, and I think the quality uh, matched the performances. But I found it very, very difficult to, uh, to get Melbourne artists uh, recognised in Sydney. And yet uh, these Sydney artists were being recognised down here. And the young people were going out and buying their records. And I thought, well, around about time I stopped playing Sydney records until Sydney DJs gave the Melbourne, uh, the Melbourne Rock and Roll Stars a fair go. So I declared war on Sydney radio. And uh, I stopped playing all records out of Sydney for one and a half years which created quite a furor. And you can imagine the, uh, the uh, ironic, um, ironic cheers I'd, I'd get from, um, from some of the people in Sydney when I appeared up there on some of the big shows. Oof. Oh, it was terrible, terrifying. Really. Well, did, you, did you prove the point, Stan? I did prove the point, yes. Yeah, uh, what made me change my mind and was really Johnny O'Keefe was the one man that really made me change my mind because Johnny O'Keefe himself, although he was getting airplay in Sydney, wasn't quite as popular really as Cold Joy was. And the Sydney DJs were uh, intent on making Cold Joy the number one man in Australia. And I became intent on making Johnny O'Keefe the, the number one man. So eventually, uh, Johnny O'Keefe had to come to Melbourne to really find the fame he, uh, he, he ultimately uh, found and, and became the king of rock and roll in this country and also the father of rock and roll in many ways, the founding father of rock and roll, as I would say, Australia-wide. Stan, in those days, in the late 50s, when you were doing Platter Parade on 3KZ, did you have a tie-up with uh, Lee Gordon, the promoter, so that you had access to interviews with people like Frank Sinatra, Louis Armstrong and Nat King Cole? Uh, that was easy, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. uh, Lee Gordon, of course, was never, as we all know, a well man. I don't think many people realise that uh, he had brain surgery in Honolulu. Uh, and he was a man that uh, had uh, a form of Alzheimer's disease, and he couldn't really, he had a bad memory. And he couldn't really remember the He could remember the far distant past, but he couldn't tell you what happened yesterday or a week before. And uh, his right-hand man was a man called Alan Heffernan. Alan is still alive with a very lovely lady and family living in Sydney. And uh, Alan was a great man, a, a lovely man, and he was a man that really was behind the throne of Lee Gordon. And it was Alan that always uh, always got you interviews with the stars. And, uh, of course, if you, had, uh, if you had the ratings and the score on the board, naturally Alan would come to you. And he always came to me in Melbourne. And uh, any time he had stars flying in from overseas, when they got to Melbourne, they always appeared with Stan the Man first. It was just a must with Alan. So we had a good rapport and a good relationship. Consequently, I got all the scoops. You were the only one doing that type of radio, Stan, as I recall. I remember 5 o'clock, that 5 o'clock time slot was, I think, occupied by the Tailwaggers Club on UZ, and I think it was the Friendly Door on DB. There was, there was no one touching that market. Well, uh, Bruce, by 1960, we were starting on the air at 3.30 in the afternoon, you may remember. Yes. We were going through from half past three to seven o'clock, but uh, what used to bug me working at KZ was not so much the fact that uh, I enjoyed and, and loved doing the job. It's just the fact that the radio station would make you go right through the day and, and finish uh, the night at 11.30 where you had to read, you had to read, hello? Yes, go ahead. Hang on. Is that better? Yep. Right, be better. Uh, yeah, so you had to read... Uh, uh, News bulletins, which which went ten minutes, and uh, do all the other programs. You know, Darrod style through on the heart of Bourke Street, yes. uh, whatever, whatever, and so it went on and on and on. And uh, I mean, it used to be a hard, hard day to get through. You'd be there at ten in the morning preparing for your program in the afternoon, and in the afternoon preparing for the program at the local pub. And uh, so you'd run over the road and start at half past three. But I said to Johnny Keep once, and Johnny said you shouldn't be doing news and all that other rubbish on a radio station. I said, Johnny, I don't know how to get out of it. I said, no, they employ me to do it. I said, I really, he said, do you realize that you have everybody in Melbourne in your right hand? I said, no. He said, well, have you ever seen a survey book? And I said, no, no one's shown me one. And Johnny, he said, my God, he said, you are naive, aren't you? And uh, he said, well, look, if you want to get out of it, he said, all you have to do is start mucking up every other thing you do on the radio station, but the program you do best, that's rock and roll. So he said, start with a news service at seven o'clock, he said, and completely, completely, he said, balls it up. He said, and uh, he said, if you do it often enough, he said, they'll take you off it. 
We're talking to Stan Rofe on Remember When tonight, but surely, Stan, you had some competition uh, further up the road at 45 Burke Street. Didn't 3UZ throw up heavyweights like Alan Lappin, Don Lund, Jeff Haynes, The Hound and Brian Taylor against you? Yes, they, they came, came against me one after the other at 3UZ, but we kept beating them all the time, mate. And um, we got to the stage where at one stage, they, uh, 3UZ even had John Laws on landline to try and take that vital yeah. time, time spot. And that not even John Laws could do it. So, um, in the long run, I won. But of course, it was rather sad to think that KZ gave away rock and roll in 1965 when uh, uh, they did rate nearly number one in breakfast with Ron Cady and certainly number one in the afternoon with Stan the Man. I remember the lineup so well in those days. There was Norman Swain, 9 to 12, Jim Archer, I Bring a Love Song from 12.30 uh, to 1.30, Kevin O'Gorman's Big Sound from 2 to 4, Under His Wings uh, uh, with uh, John Best. Uh, well, well uh, Penny Serenade was John Best. J Penny Serenade under his wings. And then at 4.30, uh, there was uh, Norman Swain and Cousin Binny. Cousin Binny, yeah. And weren't they great? Oh, what a so, great... So mid-60s, uh, when KZ changed format, you find yourself out on a limb stand? Well, Eddie Barmer, who was uh, virtually told he was leaving, whether he liked it or not, the general manager of KZ, I must say, I think I, I gave poor old Eddie a, a few grey hairs in those days, uh, but I kept disappearing north until I got more money. <laughs> I'd get on a plane and take off, and uh, they'd have to find out where I was in Australia. And uh, then I'd uh, bargain with them to come back to work. Um, but, yes, yeah, that's the way things went in those days. And, uh, you know, I eventually got more money than uh, well, the uh, the people that worked for Val Morgan and Sons and, uh, and all the people that worked at KZ. I eventually got more money per week than any of them. But, I mean, that uh, certainly um, did me no good when Eddie Barmer came to me and said, Stan, I think I would get out if I were you and go elsewhere. elsewhere. And I said, why? He said, they're about to chop rock and roll. He said, I am leaving. And so that surprised me, of course. I'm leaving. And uh, he said, there's a new manager coming in. So um, ultimately, uh, yes, I had to get out. And I resigned. Uh, I walked out, in fact. We had many arguments, the new manager and myself. Uh, we had many arguments, and, and I just walked out. And uh, I thought, well, I may go to, uh, to London to join uh, an old colleague of mine, Alan Freeman, who was working at the BBC. And Alan uh, had already told me that if I went to London, uh, I shouldn't have any trouble at all getting a job with the BBC. He said, but you may have to work perhaps at Radio Luxembourg for a while. He said, but you can board with me. And so I had my mind quite content on going to London. And uh, like 1965, as far as I was concerned, was the end of, uh, end of Stand the Man in Melbourne. But of course, Lewis Bennett, uh, the late Lewis Bennett, the three years had had other ideas. And Lewis uh, actually... Um, have called me the day after I resigned from, uh, from KZ or walked out on KZ. And uh, he said, I want you to come and see me. He said, if you go near any other radio station before you see us at 3UZ and see me, he said, don't bother coming in the front door. So I explained to, uh, to Lewis Bennett at 3UZ in those days, at 1965, that uh, Stan the Man uh, uh, was going to live on elsewhere, perhaps in, in the UK. He thought that was a silly idea and said so to me, but he said, he said we would like to have Stan the Man. He said, uh, now we have a chance. He said, tell me, he said, um, what makes you want to go to the UK? So I told him all the, all the reasons why. and said I'd had a good 10-year run in Melbourne with 3KZ. Uh, he said, well, look, he said, if we pay your fare there and back, he said, would you do me the favor of joining 3UZ for one year? And he quoted me an amount of money weekly, which was, uh, which was something like uh, three times in excess of anything KZ had ever paid me. And he said, all I want to do is see you walking around the place and here every day. He said, you don't have to go on air. He said, stay here for a year, he said, and I will pay your plane fare there and back. Of course, that was a wise move for Lewis Bennett in those days to get rid of Stan, Stan the Man anyway. But uh, then Alan, uh, Alan Lappin, you may remember Lap Lap, he became very, very sick. And uh, they asked me if I'd go on the air and fill in for Lappin. And uh, I said, yes, I would. And of course, um, I stayed there for seven years. Yes, well, that's just about almost brought us up to present time, apart from a, a little while at 3DB. Well, a little while at 3DB. I, I spent some nice years at 3UZ. Uh, we uh, we helped Johnny Farnham on his way, and, and, and I can take, to a certain degree, I can take some of the credit for Johnny Farnham's career, uh, as I can for Axiom, Twilight's Groove, and uh, Twilight.
highlights, uh, my Sydney highlights, and, and also um, a group uh, that came from Brisbane with uh, Glenn Wheatley in it called uh, Blue City Union. So uh, we had a lot to do with rock and roll at 3UZ, as you can imagine. Johnny Young, too. I played Johnny Young's record for the first first DJ in Australia, well, at least in Melbourne, to play uh, Johnny Young. So I dare say somewhere along the line I gave Johnny Young a start as well. So uh, uh, we were sort of making hits uh, for artists all the way down the line to 1971 when I left 3UZ. I then went to, uh, to 3XY. I went to 3XY as assistant program director, music director, and uh, on-air morning personality, working between nine and twelve noon and uh, there I stayed for as I say say, till around about seven years when they had totally new management uh, and of course uh, I didn't uh, I didn't see eye to eye with uh, what was happening to uh, to 3XY even though they were riding the crest of a wave uh, they were number one and uh, even though they were number one I chose to get out and go to uh, to 3DB and I'm rather glad I did. In 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 hindsight, uh, some people would say that's a silly thing to do, resign from a number one station and we go to a station down the bottom of the ladder. But I did that, and I'm not sorry I did. I thoroughly enjoyed my time at 3DB. Certainly it was very old-fashioned. It wasn't rating very well, and, and I took took the reins there. And we managed to pull the old radio station around so that even though it never rated uh, number one, it, 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 its ratings weren't all that bad. And, of course, uh, 3B very quickly became Double T. And uh, when it became Double T, that's when I resigned and and got out and decided uh, that uh, I'd rather work for myself and uh, and retire from full-time broadcasting. Stan, you've given us a real treat tonight. You've reminisced from the very early days. You've, you've unfurled a wonderful story. But I'm just going to bring back a few pleasant memories, or not so pleasant perhaps, from the old trades hall, where one of the jobs that you were asked to do, along with myself and all the other announcers, was to do the Val Morgan ads in that big auditorium there in the trades hall. Have a listen to this, Stan. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jim Archer and Stan Roof of 3K Research bringing you the following announcements on behalf of Val Morgan and Sons. Keep the cold outside. A full range of winter heating appliances, electric radiators, kerosene heaters and wonder heat is available from Kids Hardware Store, your leading hardware dealers. For that extra special hairstyle, make your appointment with Gopal's Modern Hairdressing Salon. Specialist in permanent weaving, trim, sets and razor cuts. All done to your individual... Yeah, you would have loathed doing that, Stan. <laughs> I used to hate it. You know, we got two and six. I got two shillings a theatre. Yeah, well, I got two and six. I was luckier. I got 50 cents. When I became a DJ at 3K, a disc jockey, a good old disc jockey, uh, they threw me off and said they couldn't understand the word I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, were you ever subject... Well, I couldn't. <laughs> were you ever subject to, to bribery and corruption in the form of payola? Payola did exist, yes, it did. Yep, 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 yep. There's no doubt about that. It did exist. It was in the business. Um, I'm very pleased to say that I did not accept payola. I never did. Never accepted one cent for playing a record, nor promoting any show whatsoever either. Uh, but I will not name the disc jockeys in this, this, this city that uh, received payola, uh, as I think that would be um, incorrect. And um, uh, well, I'll put it this way: um, when one reflects on the past, it's not uh, it's not a nice thing to drag uh, drag uh, a name that were well known in this town through the mud and I certainly don't intend doing that but yes, payola did exist Um, possibly towards uh, the end of the 60s it did exist more in the form of the number of records given by record companies to get airplay from various DJs at 3UZ so it it was quite uh, quite natural to see some DJs getting uh, upwards of uh, one to two hundred new albums uh, per week uh, and running off down to sell them at record bars for about half the price that record bars would normally pay for them. Yes. Stan, we have to wrap this up, but I'd like to speak to you all night. It's just so much part of Melbourne, your life story in uh, in Melbourne radio. But I'd like you to turn back the hands of time. It's 7 o'clock. Five of us are around that uh, RCA Victor microphone in Studio 1 at 3KZ. And we'd always say, we'll see you outside. Where? Outside a Hoyt Suburban Theatre. Yeah. Stan, thanks for being our special guest on Remember When. Thank you very much, Bruce. Stan Rowe. Both of you, continue good luck. Thank you, Stan. Right, thank you.